All right, welcome to Sunday evening. Uh, once a quarter, we like to do a little bit of a Q&A, and uh, usually we'll field questions from, uh, from the gallery. Uh, this evening is going to be a little bit different. I have some pointed questions for Omri and for John, and uh, if you behave yourselves, you might get to ask questions at the end. We'll just see how this goes. Um, but uh, I want to just ask Omri and John a couple of questions to, to get us thinking about some current cultural trends and how we need to be thinking about them. So, uh, Omri, we're going to start with you. And uh, Omri, you're working on a, a little bit of a writing project uh, in an area that you have been uh, reading for, researching in, uh, interacting with kind of all sides on. And it is the area of uh, critical race theory and its intersection with biblical worldview. And I uh, just want to ask you, um, what do you have in mind? Why do you see this as an important issue? Uh, what is perhaps dangerous um, about critical race theory? Yeah. Is this on? Great. Um, you know, there's a, you don't have to have tons of knowledge to you know, know what's going on. Uh, and just culturally, as it relates to uh, race and racism and social justice. And so um, my personal investment, I guess, just being a shepherd here has been uh, wanting to see the sheep at this church cared well for. Uh, I was, I mean, we've navigated this as a church over the years uh, since, you know, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, uh, this church hasn't been without a uh, scar from those events. And we've had to help sheep uh, think through those things and kind of weather uh, accusations. And so it's been a long time just wanting to help the body uh, know how to think about those things biblically. And um, in in 2020 in particular, uh, as, you know, Black Lives Matter, the organization movement kind of at its peak, uh, probably, you know, everybody was at home with nothing better to do uh, than riot and think about these issues, I guess. But um, I was being asked personally uh, my opinion on these things. And so just going to the same passages, uh, prayerfully reconsidering the same texts, searching scripture, uh, and then trying to be able to give answers, biblical answers uh, to these issues. And so what started as just a document for our small group, actually, with just passages and uh, some of my own commentary on how those passages related to these issues uh, has kind of expanded uh, since 2020. And so uh, I think really the value, because, you know, one day, eventually, Lord willing, soon, this whole movement will be behind us. And the church will be faced with another set of errors and another set of issues that undermine the gospel and attack scripture. And so why put so much uh, effort and so many hours into something sort of this niche? Uh, obviously, it has its place currently, but I think long term, my hope is that a resource like this will uh, help our church increase its confidence in the sufficiency of Scripture uh, so that we see, wow, the Bible is thoroughly sufficient uh, and superior in everything that God said uh, for these blooming cultural issues. And so when, when the movement's done, when the uh, threat has passed as it comes to, uh, you know, critical race theory or the Black Lives Matter movement, racism, thinking through those things, Lord willing, uh, our church will have uh, read the resource and just been bolstered in our confidence in what scripture has to say to us. So that's the ultimate, I think, value in, in working on something like that. 
So, Amri, you, you spoke about the current issue we need to be equipped well to think about and address, um, and then the long-term sort of transcendent reality that errors will come. Uh, if you were to nail down what is the issue with critical race theory that is problematic for a biblical worldview, what is that? And, and then if you were to think about um, beyond the, the, the current climate, um, is there something in that that will crop up another way with another issue down the road? Yep, I think uh, probably the the central issue, uh, the the main issue being attacked is uh, biblical uh, unity, unity in the church. Um, there's lots of things. I mean, First Timothy three fifteen says that the church is the pillar and support of the truth, and so as goes the church, so goes God's truth. Right, the church is being has been tasked by her Lord Jesus to take His truth into the world, and as they live lives conforming to that truth, to proclaim that truth, make it known to a lost and dying world. Uh, and no other institution on planet Earth has been ever tasked with doing what we've been called to do as the church. And so, if which I think critical race theory uh, does. Um, it's this idea that uh, America and, you know, culture has been so thoroughly saturated with racism that the majority culture, i.e. white people, um, have been so socialized and uh, racialized is the term that sociologists use that there's no way you could avoid practicing this sin of racism. And so people come up with all kinds of solutions. You're probably hearing about them, you know, in your kids' schools or at your job. They've got diversity trainings where they're teaching people. Um, the question is not if you are racist. The question is how have your racist tendencies um, that you can't see how have they worked themselves out in your life? Uh, and so obviously for the church, if it's true that as James 127 says, the church can't remain unstained by the world. And this institution that Christ has established is uh, or includes various ethnicities and has been taken the gospel, which people who hold to that theory would say, um, have been affected, like even our message in Christianity has been, uh, because it's so associated with Western tradition, um, there's no way to get around the discrimination, um, disparities, race, racist practices in Christianity. Well, that just obviously undermines our whole message, right? And so people and churches have actually caved and capitulated on that point, and they've been uh, begun to rethink what the message is, the gospel from the ground up, how we do ministry. Um, the most important thing is not having men leading the church who fit the description of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, but we need to diversify our uh, leadership, which means you have to have a certain percentage of elders who look like, you know, me who are black or women or identify as a different gender or all of those things. So critical race theory kind of intersects with, no pun intended, uh, those, those things. Um, and that just undermines everything really Christ has given the church to do and be uh, about. And we just need to be reminded of what's true and that we can't escape the, the scorn of the world following Jesus' uh, leadership. When you, when you identify what's wrong with something like critical race theory, uh, there's an intention in there. Whether or not the, the movers and shakers in a movement like that have some insidious plot to do something else with it, there's a whole gaggle of people that sort of glom on with a well-intentioned desire. Hey, something about that sounds good and right. What is it that sounds good and right about identifying everybody as a racist? 
<laughs> when you put it that way. You know, some of the things that people are after are things that Christians actually champion. Justice, equity, uh, righteousness. And those actually aren't even the world's terms. Those are, those are our terms. Those are our words. Uh, God is those things, right? Um, righteous, just, impartial. And so those are actually good words. And when they are uh, used and, and not well-defined, then Christians you know, can subtly be lured into, hey, we're doing those things that you say you're about. Get on the same page with us. And um, Proverbs 2, uh, 9 and 10 are helpful because it says after, you know, the first few verses in that chapter happen, you pursue diligently and humbly God's wisdom, incline your heart to God's wisdom, his understanding. That is the foundation of knowledge. So verse 9 and 10 can happen. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. Uh, Christians have fallen into the, the trap where the world says, hey, we're doing these, these good things. Doesn't your Jesus say that you're supposed to be about these things? What, what are you guys doing? Christians have fallen into the trap of saying, oh, yeah, we need to, you're right, we are supposed to be doing that. Let's learn from you how to do these biblical things. But Proverbs 2 helpfully reminds us that uh, it's only after pursuing God's wisdom on his terms that we can lay hold of things like righteousness and justice and equity. And then if anything else falls outside of what might be labeled those, every good path. Uh, the world doesn't have any good paths for the Christian to walk on that God's word doesn't clearly already define. And so we just, we need to be established there. The world, the world hasn't had any good works predestined for them. And so uh, what does God call us to? Um, it's sort of like the, the old Gandhi quote, I love your Jesus, but not your Christians, you know? Um, yeah, the, 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 the Jesus Gandhi thought he loved was, was a false Christ. And so that's a good reminder for, for us to not be intimidated by the world saying, we're doing your good works. What about you? Well, as defined by God, um, Proverbs 28, 5, evil men do not understand justice. And so that's what we can stand on. All right. Last question on this uh, line of, of, of thought here. Uh, in 90 seconds, Omri, give us a biblical worldview of race, ethnicity, slavery, justice, love, diversity, and unity. <laughs> uh, Acts 17, God created all men from one race, from, from one man. All races come from one man. So it's the human race, it's one race. Uh, at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, God created different nations, gave them different languages, divided them, and in Acts 2, those languages and nations are united uh, in the church where the church is, is birthed. And so if you want equity and justice and diversity, then the church is the only way you can find that, only place you can find that on earth, on God's terms. Thank you. That was a really good answer. <laughs> he was waiting for you to give him the beatbox behind it. <laughs> that wouldn't have helped anyone. <laughs> All right, John, here's your question. In 2008, uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden ran on the Democratic ticket, and a platform plank in that 2008 presidential race was a, tra a view of traditional marriage, one man and one woman, and they ran on that as a platform plank in 2008. That wasn't very long ago. Mm -mm. It seems like talking about gay marriage is way back in the rearview mirror. We've experienced a slide. Anybody who didn't believe in a slippery slope was just wrong. Uh, and, and, and now a White House position is pushing a radical agenda of transgenderism and normalizing things that were completely aberrant in a presidential race not that long ago with some of the same people. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us how to think about that. Uh, I mean, it's just... 
It's pretty crazy to see the speed with which things are changing. And uh, I don't have to rehearse history for anybody who's um, older than me, but maybe, maybe some of you younger folks it might be helpful to even hear a little bit of this. Um, you know, there was that book that came out after the, after the ball in the late 80s. And um, uh, it, it was basically a description of how a culture would go uh, embraceive a uh, pro-homosexual in rapid fashion. And they basically, it was like a social um, blueprint for how to do that. And it basically describes, make sure that you promote um, very popular, witty, good-looking homosexuals to positions of prominence. You get them in media, you get them in music, you get them in entertainment. Um, you make sure that you promote um, views of homosexuality that where, where there's loyalty, monogamy, long-lasting relationships. And it just, it was like one, you know, check mark after check mark. And it was just literally exactly what America has done. And that book was written, I think when Reagan, it might have been, I don't remember if it was in the Reagan era, but it was a long time ago, relatively speaking. And, you know, so if that's 2008, you fast forward to uh, the, the big one when I was doing college ministry was Obergefell. Obergefell versus Hodges was the, he was the defending Ohio Department of, of Health or whatever, and Obergefell was pursuing gay marriage. So that hits the Supreme Court in 2015, and it just overturns every previous hearing. And so now it's binding on all 50 states, it's binding on D.C. and every, you know, whatever remotely close to America there is. It's just now it's binding um, that they all have to honor same-sex marriage. That's 2015. Um, seven years ago. I mean, when that happened uh, as a college pastor, it was just like, just crazy. And now it's just like, yep, that's the country we live in. It's just, it's just that's just seven years ago. Um, I, you know, but it's interesting, like, there's, I, I want to... How we have to think about this, we definitely have to think about this theologically. Um, there, there, it's, it's so much bigger than just a, um, a tax credit or some sort of social, you know, the, 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 the culture does not determine our conscience. It's so much bigger than these things. Um, but it affects everything. I think of the, uh, you know, when no-fault divorce was first, when that first happened in like 69, 70, whenever that was, that was revolutionary. And, you know, now here we are, uh, we're, now we're way beyond Obergefell. Now it's, now you don't even, I don't even know how you would even define a proper uh, homosexual marriage if you were self-identifying your gender. So now you, you, you have everything is up for grabs. Everything's being debated. Everything's being attacked. What is the common denominator? I'll make it very simple. The image of God. I mean, wherever the world finds a vestige of the image of God, it will hate it and it will attack. I mean, it's just that simple. And so, like, in fact, it's probably worth reading. Listen to, listen to Genesis 1 and just think about this now um, as a common denominator for why we see what we see. I mean, this, this, this is going to connect some dots from <laughs> no-fault divorce to uh, homosexuality to uh, transgenderism to postmodern use of language. All of that has a common denominator in the image of God. This is, this is ridiculous how, how binding this is on, on everything we see that's being rebelled against. Verse, uh, Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make man in our image. And again, the pronouns there are important because they're plural. Um, the plurality here is important because of the, what this image looks like. Let, it, let, man, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the sky, uh, the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over the, every living thing that moves on the earth. And it gives them dominion. I mean, you start to see, like, what is, what's, what's not covered in these three verses? First of all, man has given, he's been given a relationship ability because he's created in the image of a Trinitarian God. So now there's relationship that's possible. There's specific genders. And uh, there's only two. 
male and female. There it is. You created a man in the image of God, and they're male and female. Those are the two genders. It's just that. And he's communicating to himself, hey, let's, let us make man in our image. And so this inter-Trinitarian conversation's happening, and then as soon as man's created, God starts speaking to man. And so you have all, everything happening here. By the time you get to chapter 2, he joins man to his wife, and they become one flesh, Genesis 2.24. And so just right there in the creation account, you have gender, you have personhood, you have relationship, you have marriage, um, you have language, language ability and its contributions to relationship. I mean, what? there's nothing sacred that does not tie directly to the image of God, and it's all under assault. I, I spoke at a conference, I think it was, I think it was a little after, it was after 2015, after the Obergefell decision, and I, I remember working through the anacronym at the time. So the anacronym at the time was LGBT, oh, sorry, LGBT2QQIA. So that's probably around 2016, 2017. Um, you know, the most cutting edge research that I could find on Google. And, um, and I, you know, I gave up at that point. I needed that information for some sort of sermon illustration, but I gave up because, I mean, you, it's just a matter of weeks before there's 30 more acronyms, and then there's just, and it's like you can't even keep up with that. To, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, two sex, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual. I don't know the difference between intersex and two sex, but those. Er, it's like I started. I started thinking about it. If this is being driven by an antagonism to the image of God, no wonder they're just getting bored with old forms of rebellion. And I think about that. Like I mean, this is hopefully a helpful theological connection. Look at Romans for a second. Because Romans gives us an explanation. There, there's a, um, a vice list at the end of Romans that's very helpful. And of course, he talks about um, sin, and sin is not just um, homosexual. Sin is also um, heterosexual impurity. Um, and so he talks about that in verses 24 and 25. He talks about the, um, hetero, uh, the homosexual uh, perversion in 26 and 27. And then he talks about depraved mind that can no longer judge what's proper in verses 28 and following. Now we dive into this vice list, and the vice list starts in verse 29. Let me just read it here. Uh, Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. And then he keeps going, uh, verses 31 and 32. But those last two are fascinating. Disobedient to parents makes the vice lifts at the same level as inventors of evil. They're both just blatant disregard for God and his authority. One is going to be common to a elementary school kid who is just, I just want to disobey my parents. And the other one's going to be common to somebody who is so bored with the old forms of evil, he's got to invent new forms of it. And so the stimulation that uh, comes from um, perversion and sin and pushing the envelope starts to wear out, so they just kind of invent new forms of it. And you start, you start seeing people get bored with those old forms from even to, whenever that was, 2016. Those are, that's a totally outdated list of the kind of identities that you can come up with. Um, and so now it's like, you know, we just, we just got a, the most recent um, issue of Sports Illustrated, um, a write-up of uh, Leah Thomas, get, you know, getting fifth place in the women's, um, I don't even remember what event, but you know, a, race, a swimming race. She gets fifth place in the NCAA finals, and she's a man. <laughs> Leah's a man. So the entire article calls her a she, and, and it just is boasting in her accomplishments, and you know, she's undergoing hormone therapy, and but, you know, it, it documents this other girl who got fifth who didn't even get the award because the NCAA said, no, no, Leah Thomas is going to get the award. You're just going to get mailed to you. And um, there, it's like, she's just, she's a, she's a guy. Like, how do you even say that? You, you can't even, hard, you, you can't even, um, you don't even want to validate it. And, and that's something that we have to be really on guard for is theologically, if we're aware of what's driving it, is making sure that we're not validating it, but also making sure that we're loving and respecting those who are, completely ensnared by it. And, um, and if I can just say one last comment. Uh, theologically, I think it's helpful to, to appreciate what Paul does. And this, well, honestly, this came to mind when you asked, I'm, I'm kind of stealing your question to Omri, what's kind of the, the, the burden here? What's the biggest threat? Um, I could say a, a massive threat 
is what it's going to do to families. A massive threat is what it's going to do to people's joy. People are going to be miserable. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I shared the gospel with um, a homosexual. And we started talking through the difference between converting to heterosexuality versus converting to Christ. And he got it. He got it. He's like, you're saying, I got to live for Christ, not for self? I said, yeah, that's it. He's like, John, nobody lives that way. And I said, well, I know some, I know some Christians who do, you know? Um, but I was, just, I was just telling him, like, this is, this, is, this is what the call is. And he, in this moment of, I think he was trying to give, put a shock. He's, I think he was trying to do some shock value to, to slow me down as I'm articulating truth to him. And he started just, it was like a moment of transparency. He started describing his life, and I won't go into it. But I remember being so grieved because he was so miserable. And I just think, man, that's what, that's the lie Satan would love to tell people. You go do, go do what you want to do. And it's just miserable. Sin is its worst consequence because you actually get what you're after. And it's a perverse desire, desire to begin with. And I think the, that's still not even the worst. That's still not even the worst. I think the worst thing that I could think of is coming up in, in 2 Timothy 3, where Paul warns that in the last days, difficult times are going to come. And he's describing the church. And I mean, this is what's so tragic is now the church is getting confused by this. And you have people in the church um, saying that, uh, you know, that was, that was a debate when I was doing my, my doctorate. I remember having a lot of conversations. You know, can, can, can there be such a thing as a same-sex attracted pastor? Because a pastor in Britain wrote a book by that title. Um, the Surprising Plausibility of Same-Sex Attraction. And this is starting to come embraced in the church. And so here's what happens. Verse 2, men will be lovers of self, Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now that's interesting because this list starts with lovers of self. It ends with lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And what happens is in the church, that starts to become accepted where you can actually love self and love pleasure rather than love God. And what that produces in verse 5 is they hold to a form of godliness, although they've denied its power, avoid such men as these. And believer, think about it. The, the effect of this would be that your sin is no longer sin, so now you're actually outside the hope of Christ. Whereas if the truth is being taught about gender, you know, gender self-identity or um, sexual perversion or heterosexual immorality, if the truth is being taught about that, there's hope. There's hope because Christ came to die for sinners. But as long as the, when the church starts capitulating, now, there's, now that's actually accepted, and so you're left with this empty form of godliness, but you've denied its power because there's no power over sin outside of confessing and forsaking sin because of Christ's work on the cross. So it absolutely undermines the gospel, and that's even worse than undermining the family. So I think that's, that's where it's, you know, that's obviously where we're at is seeing this in the church now, and that's what's so, so tragic, but comment on uh, what you said about the joylessness of that lifestyle. Mm. Uh, Psalm 16.4 says, the sorrows of those who go after another God will be multiplied. The sorrows of those who go after another God will be multiplied. Idolaters are not happy people because uh, only joy satisfaction is found in Christ. Yeah. Um, and you just think about, I mean, just the relationship between the two things we're talking about, homosexuality, which gay, meaning happy, is, is a terrible mm. euphemism for homosexuals because they're not happy. Um, but then that and, and even the, the whole critical race movement, the woke movement, uh, people insisting that they're victims of something someone else has done. I mean, these, these errors really do strip people of joy. Uh, reparations are not coming. Mm. Um, your problems, if you would just own them and, and obey the Lord, uh, there's actually a remedy to sinful decisions uh, that, that people make. And as soon as you say, well, that's not actually sin, you redefine sin, then you actually, exactly what you said, you take it out of the realm of, of hope because Christ didn't come to solve all your, your earthly troubles. He didn't come to fix everybody else's wrong against you. 
He came to deal with your own sin. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually have joy in the midst of whatever situation you find yourself, but that requires a putting off of idolatry and believing God. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Both of you guys took us back to Genesis in this discussion and the dismantling of language, the dismantling of image bearers, uh, one race made in God's image, male and female created, and then having conversations. And, and the serpent enters in in Genesis 3. And he doesn't come in with an outright lie at first. He just asks a question. And I get the sense in the woke movement and in the LGBTQ, there, there's, a, there's a reason that there's always another letter added to the end of that alphabet soup. Um, there's always another racial offense that must be guarded against. Um, to, to keep those who hold to truth and a consistent biblical worldview on their heels. Hmm. And along with that slide, we see the, I mean, the church has a, has a notorious record of following along with the culture. Um, I want to know from both of you, what drives uh, Christian adhesion to cultural slide? Why do Christians do that? Why does the church do that? And what's the remedy? Hmm. You want me to dive in? Well, I, I think one of the reasons, inevitably, is what Paul warns against in Philippians. And there's always a temptation to fear. Um, I, I, know, I, know, I know that in my own heart. Like, I'm, I've asked the question, I asked the question when we were, you know, 16 years ago, we were having our first child. And I remember looking at the culture, and I remember wondering, by the time this kid is having kids, am I going to be able to preach Romans 1 without getting arrested? And, and there's, you know, there's a legitimate fear there. It's like, I, I want to I raise my kids. I want to, <laughs> right? It's like, that's an appropriate desire. And then there's these, these fears about how that's going to go. And Paul, man, this is just a powerful paragraph. Look at real quick at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 to 30, because Paul's in prison and he's fearless. Um, he is absolutely fearless. And he's telling the Philippians in verse 27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And that too is from God. Because it's been granted to you for Christ's sake, not only to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. So God's giving two things to Christians, faith and suffering. Those are the two gifts. And I just think, man, sometimes the, the gospel gets lost because there's always a cost to be faithful. And Paul's reminding the Philippians here that there's a cost to being faithful. And what's, what's compelling about this is, is not that you know, Christians are you know, just drawing lines in the sand and just being hard-nosed and being unloving towards people, but that they are firmly and humbly holding forth truth and they're not backing down because they know that this is true and they know that the gospel needs to be heard. And when we actually stand for truth and love our gay and heterosexual neighbors, we're actually going to model the gospel when we do that with boldness, not even, not even threatened by the potential harm. Because what happens is that that's the power that the godless form of Christianity, you know, they have, they have a form of godliness, but they've denied its power. Well, when the church starts embracing all of these other isms that, that are currently the ones, and then 20 years from now, when it's the next gen, 2.0 of isms, and then the next 20 years, and they, they just start embracing the world's isms, it's going to continue to be church that's just weak, has no power against sin, has no gospel. But where the church stands firm, it's interesting that what's compelling is going to be a church that believes the gospel so fiercely that they're willing to suffer for it. That's compelling to an unbeliever to say, wow, I don't have that. I don't have that. They fiercely believe this. The only explanation for the way that they're loving on us is that they actually believe Christ. And so they're fearless in the face of persecution. And then Paul says, when that happens, they'll know that their destruction is from God and your salvation is from God. What a compelling evangelism that is, is when Christians... Um, you know, buck the trend of that temptation to become fearful. I think fear is a big part of it. And then the, the flip side of that same motive is desire for popularity. Fear and desire to popularity. So that, that's like the insecure form. It's like, I really hope that the world thinks that Christ is cool and 
and then you just get insecure because suddenly you stop trusting that Christ is the Lord. We do not have to worry about him being cool. <laughs> Let me uh, shift gears to thinking about parenting and maybe thinking about ministering to students and uh, thinking about helping each other. Um, specifically, how do we help uphold a biblical worldview on truth, uh, whether it's in relationship to CRT or whether it's transgenderism or anything else? Um, how do we uphold biblical convictions about what's true, help our fourth graders walk into a classroom and be prepared to be told, you're racist because, um, or you need to embrace all that's out here um, and be tolerant in the way the world means tolerant? How do we help them to walk into that and uphold biblical conviction and be compassionate to those who are deceived, those who are blinded, uh, those who are ensnared, enslaved, trapped, taught otherwise, etc.? cetera? Um, you know, uh, we were all part of the system at one point too, and God rescued us out of the system. Now, how do we interact with bold conviction and compassion for those still in the system? First thing that comes to mind for me um, in terms of maintaining and then passing on biblical convictions is you actually have to have them. <laughs> you know, it'd be silly to think, hey, I, I can instill something in my children that I want them to value. Um, I can pass these things on and have this legacy of faithfulness if I don't actually do the hard work of developing the convictions uh, for myself. Um, I'm thankful that uh, as, as you think about, you know, what the, what the culture is saying about race and stuff, uh, I have a journal entry from sometime in 2010, I think, after, uh, I don't see Carla Walker in here. She might be serving. She's in Keepers, okay. She, uh, it was basically a rebuke, and I appreciated that as a, a foolish single guy um, who almost, uh, missed out on marrying Emily Johnson. You know, Carla sent me a, an email and it was basically like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> I appreciate that. We need to, you know, it was, it was good. It was good for me. Uh, but the, in this journal entry, uh, whatever, you know, her rebuke had the effect of making me go back to the scriptures and say, okay, um, what do I need to be thinking? And, and, and this wasn't, this didn't happen in a vacuum. Um, if you want the long story, later I can give it to you. Uh, we dated for a while, broke up, I returned the engagement ring, you know. And then I'm sitting at the Starbucks. <laughs> I know, it's a long story uh, for later. <laughs> um, I didn't have biblical convictions as a single guy. I didn't have the clarity, uh, and I wasn't convinced enough of what God valued in a woman to get rid of all of my ridiculous preferences and say, this is what I should be wanting. Now, let me get my desires in line with what God says is desirable. Um, I had to articulate just for my own heart, what's right about um, a desire to marry this woman who's incredibly godly? Because um, just because she's godly doesn't mean I desire to marry her for the right reasons. And so just um, one of the things that made that list that stands out to me and, and has over the, all the cultural upheaval is that I was convinced God would be honored by me, black guy from New Orleans, marrying Emily, white girl, loves country music from Mesa, Arizona, um, because of the difference uh, that, that would highlight, hey, we're so different and we love each other because of what the gospel has done to us. So it's like just one example of how formulating biblical convictions uh, turned into this 10-year-long marriage currently. And we teach our children, uh, you know, I mean, a, a good view of what God does in the gospel between different ethnicities, people who don't look alike, it's just on display in our home, you know? And so we can uh, easily instill those things uh, now in our children. So I, I think just having, doing the hard work, right? That's hard work to overturn your own uh, opinions, 
however you might naturally think about something, and then bring them in subjection to the scriptures. And that has to do with everything, how you think about self, how you think about um, other people, how you think about marriage, parenting, work, the church, uh, just everything. Doing the hard work of going and getting the convictions for yourself, not because my pastor preached a great sermon, so I'm going to believe him, but what does the scripture say? Uh, and you just think about how that was being undermined in Genesis 3, just to introduce doubt and unbelief about what God said. That's, that's crippling to, to convictions. It makes them impossible uh, to pass on. So your kid goes into the classroom, and your kid has a friend or a teacher who is CRT, BLM, LGBTQ. What do you want them to do? That's really easy in my home. You know, I just walk them downstairs to their classroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think that, I think that there's a couple things. One, you just compassion for people who don't have a biblical worldview. I think even uh, what we've already mentioned, just the joylessness of, of these other worldviews, um, helping children to see, hey, these... There's lots to be perhaps up in arms about to defend the truth against. Uh, you know, when you go into these contexts outside of our home, like school, um, and really the, the right response is not anger primarily, not, uh, you know, going after some change in how you're being treated, but to really pity the people who have so rejected God's wisdom that they would rather suppress the truth and unrighteousness and believe a lie. You know, if we, we, we've had those conversations in our home just earlier this week uh, as we talked to our kids about something happening um, in, our, in our family. In a context besides homeschool. In home a school. context besides homeschool, yeah. Um, just trying to help them have an appreciation. Hey, don't be, don't be angry. Uh, we've had to work through not being angry, uh, but really to have compassion and pity primarily that, hey, these are, are people who we need to love and we need to love them with the truth. And so what's the, the right response? Hey, let's, let's pray for them regularly. Uh, let's think about them. How can we, how can we prepare beforehand to treat them when, uh, when we, encounter them and when they speak this way. So there's some preparation that that can happen at home for going into those situations in that way. John, how do you cultivate uh, compassionate responses from your kids as you're simultaneously forging convictions? Yeah, the um, <clears throat> that's super critical in the situation that you guys are in as parents because the, our kids are just they, they're, they're facing this all the time. Uh, just this year, we had a conversation with our boys. Um, one of their teachers uh, is self-identifying as a they. And so he is no longer Mr. He's now Mix. And uh, Mix is a term I had never heard before, uh, before this particular class. And so the boys are you know coming back and we're trying to figure this out. So I'm trying to figure out what is the meaning of this term, you know? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, we wanna, we're going to show respect to this. This is a person in a position of authority, so you're going to show respect to him. But then what does that term even mean? You know, like if this is a nonsensical term, okay, I can go with it, I guess. But if it's, something, if, if it's affirming something that we can't affirm, then that's going to be really challenging. So best I can tell, and you know, those kind of terms have like a shelf life, it feels like, of two weeks. But at the time... It was clearly a term that's used for an individual who is denying that they have a gender. And so it's just an absolute denial of God-given gender. And now that's just a complete rejection of the image of God in him. And so we had, to, we had to talk about that. We had to talk about what that meant and why that's a lie and why that's something we can't condone, but why you always speak to him respectfully. And so we just basically just told our kids, I mean, and not that you have to apply it this way, but this is what we did. We just... We just said, boys, you know, you, you, you can't call him Mix. You, you can call him teacher. You can call him by his last name and always speak respectfully. Um, but, you know, if, if he wants you to do something ridiculous and that's respect, great. 
but to deny God-given gender, that's something we can't, that's where we can't, that's a line we can't cross. And so I just want them to know that there's, some, there's, a, there's, there's something definitive in truth and in the scriptures that we're going to uphold and we have to maintain. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, when I think about the, how do you model it? How do you cultivate compassion in our, in our kids? I, I think number one is making sure that um, they're seeing it lived out in the home. Not, not just compassion to the lost, but also just masculinity and femininity, uh, making sure that those things are modeled. And, and if you're in a home where you, you don't have both of those roles, praise God you're in the church. Because, you know, single parents can still uh, model what God's called them to be, and the other gender is going to, you're going to have a plethora of godly folks in the church who can be a benefit and a blessing and an encouragement and an example to your children. And how sweet is that? Um, so modeling the roles is going to be important. You know, modeling what is biblical masculinity with sacrifice and decision-making, ownership of responsibility, um, that, that kind of um, leadership in the home, um, biblical femininity. I mean, just a joy to submit to even fallen and imperfect a leader. Just, wow, what a great testimony to the kids on, on both genders. You know, what a testimony that is to the kids. And um, and I think when it comes to our, our kids having compassion, I think then number one, again, is our modeling of compassion. You know, that that's not some sort of joke. Uh, that's not somebody that you just make fun of. That's somebody that you care for. That's somebody, that's a, that's a soul that we love, and we want to see them, like, they just need Christ. And what a privilege to be able to minister to them, to serve them somehow, if we could. Um, I think one of the helpful texts is that, and this is, this is what, how I have ministered to my own heart. Um, and when it comes to, like, a, a potential for, self-righteousness, this sticks in my mind because I was preaching the book of Titus about 10 years ago. And I, I, teach, I taught this passage on a Thursday night because I remember Friday morning having a breakfast uh, with a guy at this bagel place. And I got there super early and this guy, there was like no one in the restaurant um, and it's just this, this one guy working behind the counter. The guy I'm meeting hasn't shown up yet and I'm ordering my breakfast and the guy starts hitting on me. And I was just personally offended, like just like just so offended. And I and I sat down and and I was thinking about this. This text came to mind, and it was a rebuke to me because it says in verse chapter three, verse one, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. How do you show? every consideration for all men. Here's how, verse three, by doing this, because we also once ourselves were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of our God and Savior, his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, and he goes on to talk about pouring out Christ in us and justifying us in verse 7. And that was such a rebuke to me. I started thinking about what, what's the difference between me and that guy? The grace of God. The grace of God. What a rebuke to a self-righteous response. I mean, not that I want to get hit on, but you understand the point. Like if I'm having an unrighteous just like disdain for this guy, looking down on him as though I'm superior to him in some way, thinking, oh, he's, we're, we're sinners. The only difference between us is grace. Wow. So we've got to teach our kids that. We've got to teach our kids to, to keep that perspective. Um, and it's just, it's easy to do, uh, to just kind of adopt a mentality of just, you know, mockery or insult instead of just ex going out of your comfort zone and showing care and consideration and trying to build a relationship and care for somebody and speak truth. So, Omri, how, how do you go about articulating the gospel to woke, confused people? It was interesting, uh, just on the heels of your um, equipping hour, you know, thinking about the the gospel not being this, you know, four points. <laughs> you just bring it, the same package message to everybody. Uh, I think just in the past few years, what I've found is uh, articulating for people the... Um, necessity of submission to God's word at the at the the line of their idolatry whatever the the idol is in those conversations has been um 
you know, I'm my greatest allegiance is to my blackness. Uh, to say, well, this is a this is an interesting mark because what do you do when whatever you're vying for in the name of blackness and what you're calling justice, what happens when God's word contradicts that? Uh, I think that you know the the gospel calls people to submission to Christ's lordship. You know, there's Romans 10 that Eric Comparini asked about this morning. Um, will you acknowledge that Christ is Lord over the way you think about this issue? Uh, and there have been some who profess faith, uh, who has been really uh, clear that as, as we've had the conversation, right, I haven't ignored their questions to just, tell them Christ died for sinners, you know. But, hey, you have this, this question. Uh, we're talking about these issues. Uh, are you willing to submit to the same wisdom of God on this issue? The same wisdom of God that rescues sinners uh, through a crucified Messiah. Um, the same God who, who did that you know, what no mind, no, no ear heard, no eye had seen, no mind had imagined, uh, the gospel is the same God that says, hey, here's my wisdom in this other area. You have to submit to that same Christ. Uh, and so I think my gospel presentation to two people in, in that, uh, on that side of the issue has looked like a, a call to submit to Christ in that area of, of their lives. And, you know, just once the, once the issue has been clear, you know, I've had people say, well, if that's what God thinks, you know, you're telling me, you're bringing these passages to me. Uh, some people have told me, I don't want to hear the passage. Tell me what you think or try to walk me away from the scriptures. And as I've insisted on, this is what the scriptures say. Are you willing uh, to embrace that, because that's going to be telling, um, just calling them to, to submission there on those grounds has actually opened up conversations about this isn't, this isn't a, a race issue primarily. This is a problem with your view of, of the scriptures, what you think about God's wisdom. And so you're actually rejecting the God of the scriptures not just what God has to say about, about how you should think about this issue. And so to call them to allegiance uh, has kind of been what that looks like. And from your experience, um, people that you've known that have been racist, either maybe in the more traditional sense of the word or the woke version of racism, um, when they have come to Christ, talk to me about love. What, what changes at the heart level? I know people who uh, who fit that description, um, people who are thrilled to be in the church and can't believe that they would be loved so indiscriminately uh, in the ways that, I mean, we see lived out here. Um, that's been refreshing. And it, it's sort of like uh, the author of Hebrew says, we know by faith right, in, in 11.3, uh, how that the worlds were made by things that are not visible, but by God's word. Uh, it's sort of like the, the way to have knowledge is, is to first believe. Uh, I think in a similar way, a couple individuals that I, that I can think of who have had uh, just rejected the scriptures and disdain, had disdain for the church, uh, what it took was an a submission to Christ first, and then to be opened up to this world of, oh, this is what it's like to be amongst God's people. Uh, people genuinely love me. Um, we can maintain differences culturally. I don't have to dress like them. I don't have to talk exactly like them, but they'll love me anyway, and we maintain distinctions, but 
this is great. We've got something that supersedes uh, any any cultural distinctions. That's been refreshing in life to those people. John, last question. Um, sexuality confusion, gender confusion uh, can um, be drawn out of the human heart or um, brought to bear on a human life through a number of uh, factors, uh, whether victimization or um, peer pressure, uh, entertainment choices, cultural um, involvement, and those kinds of things. Uh, the power of suggestion is really strong right now. Um, for somebody who is um, living a lifestyle down the rabbit hole of Romans 1, maybe that's gone even so far as to be disobedient to their parents, uh, or, or even be an inventor of evil, as, as you described it earlier. Um, is there hope in the gospel for such? Man, um, absolutely. If you're hearing this like tonight or by way of recording, um, it does not matter what you, how, how you have, what form you have chosen to rebel against God. God loves to glorify his ability to forgive. We read it this morning uh, in Isaiah. Um, I am the God who forgives your transgressions. Psalm 25, verse 7 and verse 11. Uh, I wipe out your transgressions. Or as David says, wipe out my transgressions for they are great. And do this for your name's sake, O oh Lord. It's like God is a God who, if you think you could possibly out Christ, you, you have not. His grace, he loves to put his grace on display. So uh, it doesn't matter what form your rebellion against God has taken. There is hope for you, um, but the hope does not come by redefining your sin. It comes by confessing your sin, saying the same thing about your sin that God says about it. And it doesn't matter if it's the sin of pride or if it's the sin of homosexuality. Both are an abomination. They are loathsome to the Lord. And so he hates it. And uh, if you go to the Lord realizing, man, all I've done is earn your wrath, would you please take my, all of my liability, all of my guilt, would you take it and somehow get glory for your name through my life? He will love to get glory for his name through your life. Um, so do not give up. Do not despair. Um, if you're despairing and you believe you've tried to repent, it's probably because you're looking to yourself to try to accomplish something that would look good in the eyes of the church. You'll never be able to pull it off. So just, you know, there's always hope, but there's, there's no hope in trying to make it right on your own but there's always hope taking it to the Lord. Uh, he loves to forgive sin. He will transform you. He will give you Christ's righteousness. It's a righteousness none of us could have. You know, sometimes I've talked to people, I share the gospel with people, and they look at people in the church and like, oh, well, you guys just live differently. Uh, well, hopefully we do, but it's not because we started there. Um, God will give you his son of, the righteousness of his son if you trust in him. And you stop trying to prove yourself, stop trying to earn something, just trust in Christ, and he'll wipe out all of your guilt the sweetness of the gospel. Thanks, John. Appreciate yeah. that. Thanks for that question. Omri, would you uh, close us in prayer? God, thank you so much for, in your infinite wisdom, uh, building a church, your church, giving us Christ as our head, and for the sake of your own name, rescuing sinners uh, to yourself, from yourself, and, and for yourself. God, what a, a joy and a privilege it is to be adopted by you. Give us, give us the ability to believe these, these truths, uh, to rejoice in them, to boast in you, so that the world might see a, a people who are just unashamedly submitted to you and uh, lovers of sinners. God, what a privilege it would be to be used so that your name might be exalted. We know that you are using, uh, using us in this way, and we pray that you would only do so more and more as the, the day of our ultimate salvation draws near. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.